I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. All right, Jake, you look good. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start, we'll start with Jeff, you saying that. <laughs> it's all about looking good Jake, on the podcast. Jake, you look so good. <laughs> podcasts Thanks, are a medium for people like me who don't look so good. So, you know, we got to... <laughs> but okay, Jeff Bishop, Jake McCarthy, let's talk yes. crypto. Uh, Jeff, you've been in the markets forever. You were, you were running Raging Bull, which was decades ago before you were involved, the, the main message board about investing in back in the 90s. And, That's right. and Jake, Jeff tells me, you bought your first Bitcoin like eight or nine years ago. Yeah, in uh, mid to late 2013. That's great. And then and then he was also starting to tell me, but I wanted to wait for you to tell me the story, that Ken Griffin flew you on his private jet to someplace, <laughs> uh, hopefully not Jeffrey Epstein's island, to talk about no. crypto with him. No. and uh, If he did, get, don't say that. Yeah, otherwise I'd get <laughs> suicided. I could see people coming in the window. But yeah, yeah that was like 2000. 17 2018 that was kind of like the first wave when bitcoin was getting like mainstream popular that's when i first started seeing james everywhere on the internet yeah we, i just knew like a regular author before that and then i started seeing james all over the place yeah <laughs> we, we bought the internet then but uh what happened why did ken griffin fly you up where did he fly you uh to majorca is where we flew into um then we took like this small boat um out to like the northern part of ibiza um, but I was working for this nonprofit uh, consulting uh, to really help them create like an investment vehicle um, to their nonprofit. It was Fabian Gusto's Oceanic Learning Center. And the project I was working on was this um, project Proteus. And the difficulty with getting funding for it was that more people wanted to invest in it than just um, philanthropically uh, essentially donate to it um, with, <laughs> with just an exchange of their name on a part of it. Um, and the premise of it, just to quickly plug Project Proteus, at the time, it's and now it's still focused on being an underwater research facility. So attached to the seafloor, uh, it's kind of in line with the inevitability of what we think is going to come, uh, that kind of Elon Musk espouses a lot, just the destruction of our climate. And far before we have to leave the planet, we'll have to still live here. Um, and really, underwater is the, the next best habitat to kind of train for all of that in. And Speak for yourself. I don't want to live underwater. No, I mean, you also don't cool. want to live in a in smog <laughs> that's on the the ground the ground floor of your your home. Um, or, 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 but there is the Maldives, which uh, they have those underwater hotels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but looks very in any cool. Case, yeah, so yeah. so so Proteus. 
Yep. And so we had um, we had been consulting with uh, a couple firms to to raise funding through crypto for this nonprofit. Um, and so we were at, I forget the name of the restaurant, but it's some meeting in New York. Um, and towards the end of it, the CEO stayed, he stayed as well, asked me what I wanted to do with all this. Like, do I want to be in nonprofits? And I said, absolutely not. No, I want to make as much money as possible. And that way it just becomes a tool. Um, and so he just casually, uh, sipped his drink and said, I think you like my friends, uh, in the next few days, I got an email from the, the office of the founder and CEO of Citadel Capital, uh, asking if I, if I had time I believe it was like 4th of July uh, to go out. And so I told all my friends and family, hey, screw off. I'm not coming to the 4th <laughs> of July. How old are you at the time, Jake? Uh, had to have been 21, 22 at the time. Oh, oh my gosh. And so wait, where, where were you not, at that time? Not a bad time, call for a 20-year-old. I should have told you the calls I got at 21. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't get any calls. No one was calling me at 21. <laughs> like, so wait, wait, where were you? Uh, at the time of getting that. Yeah, I was on. I was literally uh, walking into. Did the you get office. an email or a phone call? What happened? How'd no, I got it? an email. I was walking into um, the, the Ocean Learning Center's office. Where was and, that? Uh, right in Midtown. On your BlackBerry or what? Uh, no, actually, the assistant that was like kind of running point for for me uh, said, "You're not going to believe the email you got." And so I sat down at my desk and I looked at <laughs> it. and I was just dumbfounded. And the email read from the CEO and founder of Citadel Capital, and I was just dumbfounded. And at first, I thought like, "Oh man, like." They're gonna totally like just give me like some excuse on why I'm I'm needed here, and it was quite the opposite. They're like, no, get the hell out of here, say yes right now and go. Uh, and you're 21 years old, and this guy says, "Come on my private jet. I want you to talk about crypto." Uh, I, it wasn't under the pretense of talking about crypto. I think it was just the other conversations that we had had, and really, I think it was my response. Um, the only conversations I added to were ones about cryptocurrency for sure. When I was 21, I had like a pager and I get my friends once in a while send me a little message. Yeah, I mean, I could <laughs> probably I have the pager. pull it up and read it still. <laughs> That's a good email to keep if you got it. That's great. Oh, no, it's yeah, a treasure. Yeah, you can frame that email. Yeah, it's a treasure. <laughs> Until I lose access to this email and then I'm doomed. So he picks you up on his private jet. He's going to Mallorca and, and then and then a, a small island, I guess, near Mallorca because you, you went on a, you basically went on a, a car service to the jet, to a boat, to his home in some exclusive island in the Mediterranean. Yeah. yeah probably it, not it, Club Med, probably his own island somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, so um, okay, so what's the first thing he says to you? When I was getting on the plane, uh, how you been? Yeah. I mean, it was middle of the night. Uh, I think they were just flying because it was the 5th of July, so they were just flying out of 4th of July. So it was 4th of July night, really right. going into the 5th. Um, but really, it was that. Uh, there was someone else on the plane. Um, I don't know the situation of the time frame, so I'm not going to say anything. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> the he good went call. To the, went you don't want to wanna, don't wanna yeah. divulge that if you're not sure. No. Uh, so he went to the back to the bed, the the back area bedroom. They had already made up like the cot, kind of out of the couple chairs uh, into a bed, and then woke up literally like touching down in uh, Mallorca the next day. Oh, so All he didn't right. want to. He just wanted to rest on the plane because he knew. Uh, he wanted to be awake and alive when when the plane landed. So you yeah, didn't have your you're gonna be in no good spirits for the thought. yacht. You don't want to yeah. sleep there. Yeah, I mean, I certainly had plenty more interaction past the the jet. So yeah, we touched down in Mallorca, um, jump on this like little. It was it, I say little, but it was probably the size of most people's boats. But it was so beautiful, like completely made of wood. Um, wow, big ass engines on the back of it, <laughs> um, and rushed us out to an like the rising sun, which is apparently the fourth largest yacht in the world. Uh, like Larry Ellison's old yacht, they sold to David Geffen. Um, and so this boat pulls into the bigger boat and, uh, yeah, it's quite the beginning of a trip. And, and then what happened? Like, what, what did you guys, what did he want to know? Like, what did you teach him about crypto? Um, I, again, we really just discussed Bitcoin. We discussed where I kind of saw policy moving because there was even less then than there is now. There's still yeah. very little now. Um, I mean, he didn't he didn't buy into it at all. He, funny enough, he thought it was stupid. Told me uh, that he really just thought it was a big scam. Um, well, but this we is a good starting them. point. Like, like I respect skepticism about crypto because look, For obviously, sure. people are still skeptical about it. But I mean, I think it's here to stay. But what were some of his questions, and what were some of your answers to to, to face those questions? 
What well, else were I mean, you talking about back then? Was it what else besides Bitcoin was really on the agenda? Was it just was it like is Bitcoin going to be the thing or not? Uh, well, it really, Bitcoin really dominated the majority of the conversation. That's what everybody knew, right? That was it. Uh, well, see, this is still, it, it's not that new at that point. Um, at that point, I had already been in for about four years. So we had seen the development of Litecoin come out uh, early on, Ethereum come out as well. I mean, even Doge was around then. But a guy like him, like, I mean, everybody mainstream is like, all right, there's Bitcoin and then... It was Bitcoin and That's Ethereum. That's pretty much all I want to know about, right? It was Ethereum. Really, right. those were the two. And then, and then, but there, there, there were like the, the rise of the, like Dogecoin was around then and then mm -hmm. and Monero. Like there was all the privacy, privacy coins, Litecoin, like you say. Dash. And yep. so, yeah, Dash, uh, Stellar, Lumens. The real questions came around um, Bitcoin's viability as a payment, right? And and James, I think you can speak yeah. to this as well. Over the Over the years, we've seen a transition in really what these what the narrative for these assets are, right? Bitcoin originally, not originally, but certainly when I got in 2013 was, was as a payment platform, right? And then that's when Litecoin emerged and people would describe Litecoin as the $20 bill to Bitcoin being the $100 bill, um, just in relation to Litecoin's uh, speed and lower transaction costs. Um, and so- but, but, but did he ask about like just the viability of it, period, as, as no, payment? No, because... really as payment. Yeah, can it be currency? Right, because you have to think yeah. like digital assets wasn't really even a term passed around. It's just everyone called it cryptocurrency. Yeah. And so um, how, how did you respond to the skepticism of whether or not this could even be a viable uh, currency? Uh, I, again, I just kind of more related back to what the government was doing uh, in terms of what they were doing with the dollar. And so the skepticism I completely get for cryptocurrency in general. Um, but if anyone, anyone that's done at least or at most 10 hours uh, of of research on Bitcoin um, can see how vastly different it is from, I'd say, probably 99% of the market. Um, yep. So again, the skepticism, I think, is fairly weighed, but uh, unfairly weighed upon Bitcoin as well. But the, yeah, the, so I really just kind of broke down my thought because, again, it was explained to me out of like the 2008 view of it um, that the government bailed out all these banks and no one went to jail, yet um, even personally, my friends and some family members were kicked out of their five bedroom homes into one bedroom apartments. And so, um, that kind of loss of romanticism over what, uh, the government does in terms of like a fiscal, uh, or in, in terms of fiscal policy really drove my, my love for Bitcoin. Right. And, and you're talking to a guy that probably got bailed out by the government back then. So yeah, yeah he, <laughs> he's not yeah, a big, really he doesn't hate it. And then, um, so yeah. like, what's his big, what does he hate about it? What's his, what, what kind of holes is he trying to poke in Bitcoin at that point? At that point, I just don't think that he understood it, truthfully. So he wants to that understand he did enough it. Research he just doesn't yeah. know, but he kind of has an inkling that it's going to be the future. Yeah. Yeah. I think that he was more interested um, in Ethereum at the time. And, and now you can see that certainly more true today. Um, but he scoffed at the, the market really widely and didn't care really about Bitcoin or Ethereum and and so just to like finish off on the Bitcoin point that I, I made um, was really in, in the, the funny narrative change that we've seen take place now as the store of value, right? Because even then you can kind of see that this couldn't possibly be a payment system um, in terms of like everyday use, large transactions possibly, but, but not if you're looking to buy an Arizona iced tea, right? Um, and then Ethereum at the time and the concept of smart contracts is widely different than it is today. Um, because then it was, and I think that's probably why he had more interest in it then, was that its, it's theorized application was for um, like legal agreements and, and really larger business application than we're seeing with, with NFTs and people just writing up their own ERC-20 um, contract. And, and I kind of jumped ahead there that it, that came about because of ERC-20, obviously the ability to create your own asset on Ethereum's blockchain. And so, okay, but I'm still, I still want to get through his skepticism. So, cause a lot of people, even today, like we just had the Warren Buffett annual meeting. And of course, Buffett was really down on, on Bitcoin and crypto mm -hmm. in general, but like just talking Bitcoin, how do you respond to a skeptic that say that basically I'll get to Ethereum in a second. Cause there's like a different set of skeptical questions, mm -hmm. but like with Bitcoin, you know, why not just, I, I get it what happened in 2008, the Federal Reserve, a, a handful of people made decisions about what the value of the currency in your pocket should be. And that seems unfair, but like, what will, what will really make people want to adopt 
to Bitcoin. Like right now, Bitcoin is, is hard for the average person to even get. And it's not like, yeah, I, you could use it for payments, but it's not like I go onto Amazon and one of my choices is Bitcoin, even though I can finagle it to, to take yep. Bitcoin. But like, what's, what's there a real incentive? What's the real reason for the average person to get it? Or is this just some play thing for like super rich guys? No, I, I certainly don't think that it's just a play thing. Um, I think the incentive, I'm just being a, I'm no, no, devil's I know, advocate. I know yeah. you are. I know. I trust yeah. me. I, I know your opinion on this stuff. Um, I think that the <laughs> the incentive for people to get, first off, exclusively talking about Bitcoin, um, for them to one get Bitcoin and two get it off in exchange, is is evident from what's taken place and what is taking place. So we don't even need to talk about 2008, but it, we kind of do because we need to know about quantitative easing, and since then. We've seen a rise in NASDAQ, S&P, which really, if you put against, and I'm getting big brain here, but I'll, I'll bring it no, back. But if you it. put that against M1 and M2 money supply, we've not seen new highs. We've actually barely increased. But bringing it back home, um, no, I think that, I think that anyone uh, from a farmer to someone working on Wall Street can see what has happened to their dollar, see that left or right, no one is being fiscally responsible. And really Bitcoin is an alternative option. One that I think inevitably you'll be pushed into, but right now is completely free of choice. Um, and so that's where I think the, those that are early adopters, adapters, and just interested will really reap the benefit of it. Um, Cause I still think that we are very, very early in terms of, of seeing how any of this plays out. Um, and, and in terms of its accessibility, uh, I think it's far more accessible than any other store value you could possibly name. Um, you can't get silver as easily. You can't get gold as easily. You can't get vintage alcohols as easily as you can get on an application on your phone and buy Bitcoin. And I'm not speaking from a Western perspective. I'm thinking about this globally because go to Africa and find someone that's able to get gold or silver. Is it easier for them? No. Is it easier for them to get Bitcoin? Yes. But it's easy for them to get US dollars, which is considered the flight to safety for other currencies. It's actually harder for them to get US dollars than it is for them to get Bitcoin though. Really? Yeah, I mean, think about like the exchanges, the exchange rate, uh, the counterfeit markets. Um, We're talking physical dollars versus physical, getting yeah, Bitcoin physical. on your phone or something. Yeah, yeah, we could talk about dollars in your account uh, digitally as well. Much easier. But yeah, it's much easier for those in Africa to, to escape to Bitcoin. And that's why we're seeing that take place. Uh, in Nigeria, I think Bitcoin is one of the most widely used um, I guess we could call that for this use currencies in terms of like um, cross-border transfers. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't want to like list off some random statistics because I don't have them on hand. But yeah, um, especially for like those that are uh, outside of Nigeria and sending capital back into Nigeria. Um, and so what do you want to send it back in their native currency? No, of course not. But yeah. So I think, I think in that, in, in terms of storing one's wealth, um, I mean, the next easiest might be real estate, but even that comes with its middlemen, its fees, and its barriers to entry that Bitcoin, I think, really, really far surpasses. Um, I think that, and while I say all of that, I think that it could be and will be far easier for people to get access to Bitcoin. And you can see that evident from exclusive to Bitcoin applications like Strike that Jack Mahler made, where exclusively it only allows you to purchase Bitcoin. And the real the real uh, point to bring up for, for people isn't necessarily accessibility, but it's cost, right? If you wanted to buy a dollar of Bitcoin, you should have the ability to and not have to pay 99 cents, aka 100% of your investment to a fee, which if you go on Coinbase, if you buy up to what, $10, it's 99 cents. Then to, uh, I think, twenty four fifty, it's like a dollar fifty. Okay. But again, I want to buy a dollar a day. Well, strike allows you to do that with no fee. The markup that you see is if Bitcoin is 40,000 on Coinbase on strike, it'll be 40,100. And so that 0 0.00001 fee, you're not seeing. So you can automatically invest in it. So it's very accessible, very affordable. And, and that's how, uh, I mean, you could apply that to anything, but really that's how Bitcoin wins. And so your, your point is, is that it's, it's almost like a fear asset, it, the, which is what a store of value is. It's like, I'm afraid I'm not going to find value anywhere else. So I need to store the value I've earned in life into some asset that's going to retain value. And yet Bitcoin, you know, 
how do you value Bitcoin? How does one value Bitcoin? And this is why it's so volatile. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, an easy relation to that volatility is the same, same way I would ask you, how do you value gold, right? It's the perception of that asset. And so if we bring it back to the first decade or let's say first 15 years, gold was used as a means of exchange. I'd be willing to bet that it was probably really volatile depending where and what you were trading it for, right? And so if I had one chicken and I took a ounce of gold from you, well, the next guy might give you five chickens. So that's pretty volatile. Um, and then over a couple hundred thousand years, that worked itself out. And, and more so, if anything, I think that we're, we're seeing a digital like pullback uh, on those kinds of means of exchange where the dollar is similar to gold and seashells is more similar to Bitcoin. So we use seashells as currency. Why? Because you couldn't forge them. They're pretty easily distinguishable between their qualities, uh, at least for what they used then. Um, and I think Bitcoin is similar to that where you can't really fake it. Um, and, and it's a limited quantity, even though I know seashells are not so limited, but I think you get the point. And like why Bitcoin and not some other coin or some other, fee, you know, system? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say one, the decentralized nature that Bitcoin has, no other cryptocurrency or digital asset has it. Many like to pretend that they do, but they do not. If you're saying to me, well, come on, there's just one of us that has the keys. That's pretty centralized. There's 50 of us that have keys. Okay, well, that's less centralized, but still centralized. Um, and I think the lack of control over Bitcoin's network to any like ultra small group or one individual is, makes it the most attractive. So, so like take Buffett, for example, who's a, a very smart, inv smartest investor in, in history, arguably. And other than some personal agenda that we might not know about, like maybe he, because he owns a lot of big stakes in banks, he's nervous about crypto taking over the banking system. But like, what's his real concern, do you think, about crypto and Bitcoin? I think that he's seen many shysters and charlatans come around espousing a good idea, a good investment, or the unique quality that uh, this altruistic kind of, um, these altruistic qualities that Bitcoin has. I think that he's seen that come about many times. And so he's viewing it through the, the lens that he has. And yes, I do agree. Um, and I'll say arguably, yes, one of the best investors of all time. Um, but I think that he is completely off mark on this. And I think that he's allowing his opinions to really outweigh anything else that he might be presented with. And I can heavily base that on the fact that he had that meeting with Justin Sun um, in 2017. I'm sure you remember that he won that yeah. lunch with, with Buffett. And I'm sure Justin preached some nonsense versus Bitcoin purely. But I think if anyone was to convince him, it probably would have been Justin, 30 under 30, Jack Ma's. Uh, prodigy but and yeah i think he's just missed the mark and he can't take it he, back he now. missed the whole tech boom too like the boom and bust so he saw all of that but he's smart enough to know like the internet was the future he is and mm -hmm. didn't invest in any companies until apple that's like his first big tech investment yeah, I think, right that actually, was not I think until amazon, 2018 he, he, he lent <laughs> he lent amazon a, a large amount of money i think that was his very first thing it was a convertible yeah. but um uh but that's a really good point because you know, even up to like 2001, 2002, there were a lot of people out there saying this internet thing's just a fad. It's just a scam. And obviously it wasn't, but people have to remember that it, it wasn't widely accepted that the internet was going to replace everything that we knew of in society. And here we are 20 years later and it did replace everything we know of. So what, what are going to, but, but, but the internet had some catalysts. Like I will say uh, one of the catalysts was, is that, um, at some point, everybody became comfortable opening their credit card into the internet. Uh, another catalyst was there was no sales taxes, I believe, for, for many years on e-commerce e transactions. Another catalyst was... Until Amazon ruined that. Yeah, no, I think, I think though, um, there were, it, was the, it was the law for a while that you couldn't have sales taxes, and then the law ch got changed. But, and then um, uh, by 2005, the, there was a billion users of the web. So that was maybe the big catalyst. Cause I would say after that, nobody was saying anymore that this is a fad, but what are going to be some of the catalysts that really drive Bitcoin to replace currency as we know it? Well, I don't think Bitcoin was going to replace currency as we know it. I think it's going to replace gold as we know it. Gold is, is far better used for other things than a store of value. When you have something like Bitcoin, we don't know how much unmined gold there is. So how can we 
create a base uh, of supply. We don't really even know how much gold China has hoarded or mined because they never put out real numbers. And I mean, there's, I mean, we don't even have to start venturing into the thought of like. Well, gold's the, kind of grown at the rate of inflation for 2,000 years or something. It's pretty, it's a yeah. known commodity. Like we kind of know, no one's going to find, you know, 100 million tons of gold tomorrow, allegedly. But very true. So it kind of grows at inflation. So it kind of keeps pace with that. And people are comfortable with it. So they've kind of known that, all right, that, that's a store of value. Mm-hmm. We trust it. I can hold it. I get it. There's not going to be create more of it. Crypto and Bitcoin, I get people are skeptical. I get it. No, and I get it too. I think that there's a separation um, that needs to be made. I think that like cryptocurrency is a exhausted and overused term. I think that digital assets far better describes the entirety of the space than cryptocurrency. Okay. Right? Like Ethereum itself and Uniswap and NFT and Bitcoin. They might all be cryptographically encoded, but they're not cryptocurrency. It doesn't make any sense. And so I think that will... It already is taking place. Like all, if you look at any regulation put forward, none of it says cryptocurrency. It all says digital asset. Um, and so I think the maturity of the space brings on proper terminology. So that'll figure itself out. Um, and I think that's where really people begin to automatically have this separation in their own mind of Bitcoin and everything else. And so I think that Bitcoin and its lane will replace gold. It is the digital version of gold and it has better properties than gold. It can move faster, it can be moved cheaper, and it can be better secured. This person that's a billionaire has the same security that someone with $50 then has. And I probably should say that in the inverse, and let's make it clear for everyone. Someone with $50 has the same security afforded to them that a billionaire would have. And that's simply through owning a ledger. Um, And obviously a billionaire can pay for different and better security on top of that. But more so it goes to the fact of if you had a lot of your wealth in gold, Well, all I need is one extra person or one more gun and I will take it from you. And the one that always has one more gun is the government. And so I don't like saying that it's (laughs) fear-based that the investment in Bitcoin is is there, but it's, I guess there's just not a better term for responsibly thinking about uh, the story of your wealth. But in terms of what you asked, in terms of catalysts, I think they're, they're evident every day. I think COVID spurred, a huge, uh, huge growth in the digi- digitalization of everything, not just money and, and finance and shipping. And I mean, we can go into the different things that digital assets kind of make better on blockchain. Um, but I think COVID spurred that. I think that NFTs will be far, far more massive than, than people see them now. People look at them now as JPEGs and pictures of monkeys and look, you can make great money in them, fine. But they're all missing how the utility of NFTs is going to far outweigh anything we're seeing now. You're, the title of your home is better off as an NFT than in the current system. Your driver's license, your social security card, all better off as NFTs than, than the current forms that we have them, both for personal storage as well as just utility. I, I 100% agree. I think the fact, like NFTs being semantically related to digital collectibles is like, in 1993, you know, everybody just assumed the World Wide Web was a way to do hypertext documents. Like, mm-hmm. it was just, yep. that was, everybody thought that was the one use case of the web. But I've talked to even, like, uh, sports team owners on this podcast. Like, ticketing for venues should be all NFTs. Yep. You know, when you're in the newsletter business, for instance, we're all in, in the newsletter business, paywalls for newspapers will all be NFTs eventually. Like, why not? Like, that's the great use. But now, here's a question that that a skeptic once asked me about these particular use cases. Why can't just a secure centralized database handle all that? Because it's non-transferable. Like a secure database is secure to that database. And it's non-transferable from me to you if you're in Bangladesh and I'm in Connecticut, right? Like you might be able to transfer access to it, but then you're still relying on that data system and not like a quote unquote decentralized network. And I say quote unquote because I don't agree with this sentiment that Ethereum is so decentralized. But like, why do I care about decentralized anyway? Yeah, no, no, I, that's what exactly what I was going to say. To the user, they don't, they don't care that what they're getting is more secure. But I think that, again, the catalysts play out. What we saw happen with Parler, for example, it was immediately and uniformly taken down by every app store, Google Play and, and iOS and Amazon web services took them down as well. I think that that threat... <laughs> While for your ticket to a baseball game, you might not care about the title of your home or your kid's birth certificate, you will care about. 
And so that's where, again, we have to differentiate between what we're talking about. A collectible? I don't care. If it's, I bought a ticket to see the new Batman and because of it, they gave me an NFT. Oh, great. I don't care if that's on their servers. Ethereum's makes no difference to me. But the very personal data, secure data, and data that I don't want corrupted, that, that is where the real utility comes in. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Main, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, Shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports? is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We wanna care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, 
in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Let's go with the paywall stuff for a second. Like, let's say the New York Times has a paywall and I subscribe to it. The one benefit of it being, I could think of it as an NFT, is that if I don't want the subscription anymore, I don't have to call customer service and cancel it. I can sell the NFT, which represents the subscription to the Times, to someone else who wants it on a DeFi exchange. So yeah, or even or even their own exchange, right? Like a resale of it, and that'd probably be the more useful version for them because they can collect a micro fee. Yeah, and and that's where things like that um, can be all through New York Times. I mean, they can have the utility of of yeah being on blockchain. But here's a, a piece that that I really don't even want to share because I think it's such a good idea. What have you ever gotten <laughs> from being a subscriber of the New York Times? What have they ever given you? Well, or any subscriptions. Content. Well, New what? York Times like, specifically, I was going to just slander, but... Uh, uh, yeah, no, I mean, okay. <laughs> that one in particular for James. <laughs> All right, Forbes, for example. What have the readers of Forbes right. gotten from them except for the publication? Okay, and, and I'm not really asking you to really even answer it. What if I told you instead, okay, I'm Forbes, you're a subscriber, you hold my NFT, I just interviewed Elon, and because shares are now tokenized, he just gave me a 1,000 shares to give to my top NFT holders. Here you go. You're a top NFT holder. I just airdropped you Tesla shares because I have connections to Elon Musk. I see. So you're saying, but but I, can't I do that to subscribers to Forbes? Not right now you can't. Like, like if you were to say what, like click on this link and claim all of this, fine. But that that involves in, involvement, right? I If you hold my NFT, I can just airdrop it to your wallet instantaneously. I see. So like the New York Times or Forbes knows my wallet because I have an NFT that has access to their system. So they can just send to that same address more things. Yeah, access to things, NFTs, assets themselves. Right, not just a right to shares, but the actual shares. No, the actual shares. And that's, that's where we were, I was trying to bring this back to what you had asked about what catalyst do you see coming? The, with, with COVID and the, the rush to a digital age that we're in the middle of, I think you will see the tokenization of everything. 
We are in, and so I'm sure you've heard Web3, like Web3.0. Web1 was what universities and data scientists. Web2 was WWW and an emerging World Wide Web. Um, and, and Web3 is the consumerization of data. So where in the past you were just a user and they took your data and monetized it. Now your data, and it's not just your likes or your retweets or a post you put up of your 4th of July, but instead your involvement, your clicks, which I think we all know about, your, your view, how much time you spent on a page, that is all encoded. And so cryptographically, I can say, you know what? The person that spends 30 minutes reading my article versus the person that spends two hours reading the whole report, going all the way through it, well, I'm going to reward the person that puts in more time. And now I can encode that. So it's not like a huge, huge mountain to climb in terms of work like that you'd actually have to do sending all of your readers, like click this to get your, your Tesla shares. So with everything digitized, it becomes this one universal language for basically transferring assets, just like yeah. the web became this one universal platform for transferring information. Yes, absolutely. And the cool thing about it is that you're, or we're all at the point right now where we're able to pick a team. So that's the funny thing about blockchain, right? Is that people aren't realizing that these are ecosystems, right? So Ethereum, Solana, and Avalanche, they all are layer one smart contract platforms, but the assets created on Ethereum don't translate to the assets that are on Solana. Neither do they translate to the assets on Avalanche. And so if I wanted to take Avalanche and buy something on Ethereum, well, I can't do that. I have to bridge, I have to convert, all this nonsense. Um, and so you can view it as if the three of us sitting here, uh, we each have our own internet and everyone's making websites on, on Jake's internet, Jeff's internet and James's internet. It's not very useful when we want to have a World Wide Web. And so that's the point where we're at, where we're not at the World Wide Web yet. And that World Wide Web is going to be a multi-trillion dollar product interoperability. Whoever solves that, I mean, well, well, what do you not think? to get off topic in that, but I mean, there's things like the pocket protocol. Uh, there are attempts made at kind of multi-blockchain DeFi systems. So we'll see which one wins, but they're already out there. There's already implementations yeah. of things. And I'm just wondering, okay, so, so a catalyst, so just the Winklevoss twins in 2020 wrote a report saying that if Bitcoin simply replaced gold and nothing else, it would be about a $500,000 price. And Kathy Wood from ARC has said something similar. So clearly, you know, lack of trust in a currency or fears of inflation could be a catalyst towards Bitcoin and crypto. What are, and I, I kind of think what we're seeing with Ukraine and Russia and even the convoy protest in the trucker protest in Canada yep. is like a catalyst for, for crypto. What, what, yep. what have we seen so far from like El Salvador, which has switched to accepting crypto as legal tender? Like, have they benefited from it? Is there, are they a more solid country currency? So I think anyone that Googles it, you're going to see both sides played out. Like you're going to see people that are uh, very adamantly against it in El Salvador and then those who love it, obviously. And so if you're researching it, take it with a grain of salt either side. But I think that, I think El Salvador has been at the raw end of the deal that America has given them. They have exported their best and their brightest to America, not by choice, but just simply through immigration. And so the, the thought of El Salvador as a worse off country is one is really a reality that we've kind of imposed upon them. Um, and I think, I think the, um, the president or the president of El Salvador actually said that like three, four years ago that one of their greatest export is unfortunately their people. And so I think Bitcoin gives them the ability to get off of a dollar standard and we want to talk about inflation here in the United States at eight and a half percent, which is obviously just not even realistic. Well, we export inflation first before we receive it. So inflation in El Salvador, it, this gives them an ability to kind of work around that. And you're, I mean, even if you just take how other people are reacting, right? The IMF threatening them when they said that they were going to do it in the first place and completely backing off that now. Um, and so I'm not on the ground in El Salvador. I don't know hand, like firsthand if it's better off. Um, I mean, especially this recent price action, this drawdown now, but I mean, I just got a notification. They bought 500 more Bitcoin. So I think that it seems to be working for them how, so far. How does the U S export inflation? <laughs> so, I mean, through, I mean, we could talk about a number of products, right? So the oil costs globally decided by really U S policy and OPEC. We could talk about 
the the fact that we're going to be importing less goods because inflation is on the rise here, so the cost is higher here, which means that those exporters are exporting less, so then they have to charge more, and it's like a a, a circular spiral of um, of inflation. But that, but how does we crypto solve ab- solve that problem though? Because uh, you know even if it's mm-hmm. priced in crypto. Or it, well, crypto doesn't. Bitcoin does, right? And well, how does how does Bitcoin really solve that inflation problem? Um, first off, owning one Bitcoin doesn't necessarily just do that for you, right? And so that's why they've been buying it, and that's why they just bought five hundred more. By slowly creating a reserve of Bitcoin, they can begin to base their currency and their financial future off of something far more reliable than U.S. policy. Uh, and and I don't really even like going so deep on that because, again, I'm a U.S. citizen. I served in the military. I love this country. I hope that we continue to rule the world. Um, but the policy that we put forward really doesn't help us, and it certainly doesn't help anyone else. Um, What's the yeah, benefit so, of them owning Bitcoin versus gold or some other asset they want to you know, commoditize their dollars against? Well, I wouldn't, put it the, I wouldn't even argue with them if they were to say, all right, we want to start getting rid of dollars and start hoarding gold. I think that's smarter than hoarding dollars. Um, Because if you hoard dollars, you're at the whim of who? The U.S. government? Exactly. Who's then at the whim of who? OPEC, right? I mean, if we want to talk about, like, scary shit, I mean, we could talk about how China almost convinced OPEC to start taking the remindi versus the dollar for settling oil. So, so, okay, so I'm trying to understand, though, the exporting inflation. So let's say the U.S. decides, okay, we're going to, because the oil is priced in dollars, and and because we're going to... um issue a trillion dollars worth of currency in COVID, the value of the dollar might go down. Uh, that's going to hurt anybody else who has to hoard dollars like El Salvador. So they instead will hoard crypto. Well, what's the benefit of, of Bitcoin? Uh, sorry, they'll hoard Bitcoin. What's the benefit of that over like pesos or whatever they had before? Because then the peso is still relying on a centralized government, right? And that's, I think that's the biggest selling feature on why they're hoarding Bitcoin and not Ethereum if we want to take it to just crypto in general, right? Um, and so, I mean, they could have been hoarding the remindi, they could have been hoarding, I mean, luckily they didn't hoard the, the ruble, but um, I think that it is, it is that exact point, getting out of a centralized government um, or a centralized entity for that matter, because I mean, the government doesn't really make the dollar necessarily. Um, I think that's the theme going forward. And and really- So, think- so the, downside, the downside of a centralized authority is that, that centralized authority at some point might weaken like, like or COVID, be corrupted or yeah. be corrupted. So, so like, like what we see with the ruble now, the ruble collapsed essentially. <clears throat> uh, and yep. right now the dollar either weakens or strengthens based on what a committee of like six guys do. Yeah. And I think that if we remember that how much is settled in dollars and how much international trade is, is really transacted in dollars. That's, that's primarily how we export the inflation. Um, and it's not to say like, oh, we export it so we get like 1% less. It's just we don't deal with it as quickly. And so I think over time, what you will see inevitably is more and more smaller countries moving to a Bitcoin-backed standard, um, aka the Bitcoin standard, fantastic book for anyone that hasn't read it, um, than, than a dollar standard, than a dollar reserve. It just doesn't make any sense. And if we continue to weaponize finance the way that we did against Russia, um, I think you're going to see that faster and faster. I even, I think I had this conversation with Jeff as the, the war broke out and the Russian stock market crashed. I said, watch the next thing we're going to push for is kicking them off swift. And that's going to be a very bad move because that's how we begin to lose the world reserve currency status. And what took place? India started cozying up more to Russia. OPEC, uh, in the UAE invited China to come in where they clearly were trying to convince them to, uh, settle in the remindi or the, the yen versus the dollar. And so it's, uh, it's kind of biting us in the butt there. And so, that, so yeah. like f- for a country that hoards Bitcoin, I'm just trying to work through like, how does this solve their problem? Like when the next time they go to buy oil, it's, it's always going to be like, let's hypothetically say like X mm-hmm. number of Bitcoins and not change even as the dollar or the renminbi well, or whatever sats. fluctuates. Yeah. And so if anyone isn't aware of it, the, like b- the base of Bitcoin is not Bitcoin, it's Satoshi's right. Um, named obviously after the founder or founders. And so it's like the smallest unit of measurement of Bitcoin is one sat. And there's 100 million Satoshis in one Bitcoin. And so if we wanted to talk about how a Bit- like one Bitcoin or multiple Bitcoins gets broken up, that's how it would be. Um, and, and really, I mean, if you wanted to buy oil with Bitcoin, I mean, 
if if I wanted on the premise to de-dollarize, I wanted to go into a backing of something else. I mean, what else do we have? Do we say gold? Because then how do I take this gold bar and, and trade it for oil halfway across the world? Um, and you can, and my point really is, is that trans, transfer of value is far easier in a digital sense than it is a physical sense. Yeah, just yep. just logistically, like you don't have to go mm -hmm. through a local bank, a local reserve bank, the Federal Reserve, the SWIFT system, and then all the way down the banking system of some other country. But for, for crypto, it's just wallet to wallet, so it t removes all that sort of inflation. Yep. There's like a basic inflation in the system just yeah, making the middle transactions. Man. But, um, you know, with, with, with Bitcoin, uh, I guess the argument is, again, this is not, you know, economic policy is sort of fixed in the code. So there's no way that it's going to weaken or, or it's going to print up too much or, I mean, OPEC could still move up or down the price of oil in Bitcoin. So does this solve the problem or does this kick the can of the problem? I don't think it kicks the can down the road because I don't think that people will be as willing to give up Bitcoin for oil as they are dollars. And I think that really, like I said in the, in the beginning, this is the very beginning of all of this. I think that culturally we're going to see a massive shift from what fiat has kind of shown us to be the standard that really has incentivized spending to a Bitcoin standard that really incentivizes saving. And the reason you've been incentivized to spend is because of this <laughs> invisible tax called inflation, where slowly but surely you're losing the value of your dollar over time. Pull up any chart of the value from 19, 1910 to today of the dollar, and you're going to probably wonder why. Um, so let me, let, me, let me make the counter argument to that, though, which is that since 1910, we've had unbelievable with mild inflation, mm -hmm. we've had an unbelievable century of, of prosperity and innovation, uh, particularly in, in the dollar-based country, which is the U.S. But I think that, I don't think that you're wrong at all, but I think that what people miss in that is that we have had that success, so is the world. And really, why? Like, why have we individually led such success? Well, it's because we've created the the world reserve currency status being the dollar. And I know that came out in what, 1978, 1957. I can't remember <laughs> whenever Nixon pushed that, but moving into the woods in the seventies. Yeah. What happened? Yeah, the dollar. Too. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that that really has a, a majority of the reasoning behind it. Not just that the dollar is so valuable. I think that we've kind of swindled the rest of the world into uh, this value system that the dollar represents. Um, and that's where I go to like a fiat. That's why I make that point on like a fiat standard that incentivizes spending and a, and a Bitcoin standard that incentivizes saving. Um, and, and look, maybe I'm flat wrong. Maybe people will rush to spend their Bitcoin when it's worth 500,000 per coin or a million per coin. Um, but, 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 your, but, your, <laughs> but your point is though, even if that does happen, uh, like, like if Bitcoin hits some like maximum value that people are a little uh, unsure about it, the price, at least it's not a centralized authority. That's, that's kind of making decisions. That's going to change the value of the currency in unexpected ways. Yeah. So like, for, for sure. instance, I mean, since 2020, I mean here, so I'm speaking as if speaking as if I'm the federal reserve, the federal reserve printed up $4 trillion because they thought that they were the world's and they still think this, that they are the world's reserve currency. Like what other current, their, their argument is what other currency, if you don't hold dollars, what other currency are you going to want to hold? You're not going to want to hold euros. You're not going to want to hold renminbi or pesos or euros or, or rubles. You're going to want to hold the dollar. And so they kind of felt they could print up any amount and the demand for us treasuries would be so great. They would never run into monetary inflation, which is clearly I mean, they were, I mean, it's, it's somewhat it's, wrong. I don't even know. I can't even assume that they were thinking that. I don't even assume that they were thinking. I think they were lying the pockets of themselves and their friends because it makes no sense that Kanye West, and I love Kanye, I, it makes no sense that he got PPP and everyone else got just automatically $1,200. Like, and, and this is where we can really get fun or experimental with crypto, digital assets, blockchain. Because imagine that instead of just a dollar system, which, by the way, a quick segue, we are going to this through CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, um, but we can get to that fear in a second. But imagine that we had a currency on blockchain and we look at the situation that 2020 presented us and people become out of work because of other policies we made. And we said, you know what? Those, those waitresses, bartenders that are completely out of work because we just shut down every restaurant in America, except McDonald's, 
uh, those guys will give fifteen hundred dollars too. Okay, there's people still working at McDonald's and like they're still their costs are still going up. Maybe a, a spouse, whatever reason. All right, we're gonna give them five hundred dollars. DJs are out of work, not the big ones, the ones that do weddings and bar mitzvahs. All right, those guys will give them nine hundred dollars. We can all of a sudden become surgical with monetary policy because it's all cryptographically encoded. And so the same way it's easier for me to send you something because you hold a specific kind of NFT, as does giving any sort of financial aid to anyone. Um, and so I think that's a very exciting thing to come. Um, but I don't think we're going to get that version of it uh, because what is coming is a central bank digital currency where more so instead of um, being useful, they're going to try to really apply like helicopter monetary policy. Well, but, but by then... Th th I, I would say that's the gateway drug, though, to real adaption of uh, adoption of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, because it's just one DeFi exchange away. Once you have a, a central bank digital currency, to Bitcoin. If good wins, right? And like, if you look at how humanity has kind of played out, good has won, no matter how many crazy evil things have ha taken place. Um, but that this is a this is a printing press moment, um, and I think that that is. That's really what's going to play out, um, unfortunately, over the next maybe decade. Uh, if you look at the printing press after it was created, it was not a time of peace just after it. Um, the Enlightenment did not come right away. And so I hope we don't have to go through that same kind of like 100-year war. Um, but this is that kind of moment where if the printing press had fallen into the wrong hands with the wrong reasons to print, we'd be in a totally different society and world than we are today. And the same thing is taking place here, where if we forget about Bitcoin because some dog coin comes around and makes you think, ooh, I can make $1,000 versus 10, well, we're going to end up losing out, like if, like I make with the, the point of the printing press. Um, but but, I, think, but I, think, I think just the natural use cases, though, are on the side of good. So, for instance, Fidelity just announced that they're going to allow uh, people in 401k plans to buy mm -hmm. Bitcoin. And so that opens up the gates to 21 million people who don't currently have Bitcoin. Sure. So suddenly all these people are going to hold Bitcoin, at least in their 401ks. And that, and if they have to choose a dog coin versus Bitcoin, they say, well, I already have Bitcoin, so mm -hmm. I'll choose that. And, and, so, and we'll probably have choice. So that will be a good thing. But so here's we'll where you have don't. Bitcoin. So here's where you won't have choice. So with a CBDC, because again, the same way like Bitcoin is so secure because it's cryptographically true, if I wanted to make a cryptocurrency, any of us can. And so we can encode whatever rules into that we wanted to. And so a CBDC developed by the government is going to have its own encoded rules and laws that they can change and do with what they will. So here's an example. Let's say that you're driving a diesel truck and you filled up twice this week. You go to fill up a third time, your car declines. Why? Because the government sees what you're spending with their CBDC and they say, no, you can't. Good luck rationing that second tank you still have. Or if, you're, if you love beef, you want to go on a carnivore diet, guess what? Now that's impossible because you want to go get more beef. And they say, nope, you've eaten your fill of beef this week. Go eat some bugs. And I know it's an extreme example, but how about the fact MasterCard has already created it? MasterCard has already filed the patents, already has it publicly announced uh, their ability to shut you down at the pump. And those are, by the way, the examples they use. Right, right. So, so I would think this is where good will win because just even, like when you hear those examples, it's repulsive. So, mm -hmm. and everybody's going to respond that way. No, it's not going to be the case that the entire world's going to adopt something that is clearly repulsive. But, but like, here's like, a, here's like, like you take any basic use of bitcoins or nfts like the ticketing examples i described or here's another one you talked about the tokenization of everything what if i were to what if i graduated college and i want to pay back my student loan debt but i can tokenize the next 10 years of my future income and offer it as you know like interest bearing interest bearing asset i could see yeah i could I tokenize my my future future income so all my income goes into a black box but i could tokenize 10 percent of that so now holders of those tokens they can essentially bet on me oh this guy went to this school he got this job he's a hard worker yep. we'll we'll buy one mm -hmm. you know james coin or whatever which is backed by ethereum and uh uh you know i think those are the, the use cases that are going to quickly develop that, I mean, I, I, for, for once, I love this conversation because for once that I haven't thought of that, it's like self-induced indentured servitude. Um, but, but yeah, <laughs> but, I mean, I did, but, 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 it has a, 
but but you you every you time you borrow yourself. money, every, yeah, no, every yeah. time you borrow yeah. money, fractionalize you, you, yourself for sure. I could definitely see yeah. that taking place. And and, and and then and then also I'm not responsible in the way I am as a debt holder, as an equ- as as someone who's creating equity. Yes, it's up to me to create value for my share for my equity holders for the my token holders. But I'm gonna want, I have incentive to do that anyway because 90 percent of my income goes to me, mm-hmm. and uh, so so I don't have the obligations of a debt holder. And uh, uh, you know, equity holders are taking risk more than debt holders, but. Uh, so it's not quite indentured servitude any more than debt is. Debt is worse. Yeah, self self induced. Um, yes. Yeah, I think that's definitely an, an interesting one, and I think that good does outweigh uh, the bads. But here's one that you would probably agree with. All right, so the four trillion that they printed is pretty irresponsible. Maybe we want to pull back some of that money. Well, the Fed, with such an asset as the CBDC would be able to implement a helicopter monetary policy. I can't remember her name, but Joe Biden's recommendation for a comptroller of the currency, um, Russian, uh, God, I'm forgetting her name now. Um, but either way, she is literally in an interview describing that. Like she literally uses the words we would be able to use right now if we had a CBDC helicopter monetary policy where the Fed therein, seeing that there's too much currency out in circulation, can just pull some back in. Like, and and look, maybe that's good. I would probably agree to that. It sounds like better policy than what they have. But if someone else doesn't, that instantaneously makes it wrong for them to have the right just to do it to you. Um, no, it's like Argentina in the um, yep. in the eighties was basically able to do that, where they essentially went into every bank account and took half and said, "You'll get back the other half over like a six year period." And that gets so, into why normal bank accounts are also the problem. <laughs> Right. right, and, and so, and that's also why Argentina is widely predicted as being one of the next set of countries to have the population go to Bitcoin. Well, I don't know if you uh, saw no. this, but their their request uh, to the IMF that they made, the IMF returned their request with a condition that says that they have to not only not allow the development of cryptocurrency, but actively dissuade their populace from getting into cryptocurrency. It wasn't that a scam. When I read that, I was like. <laughs> When the government tells you not to get into crypto, you're like, oh, I want to get into crypto. But, yeah. but, that, te- but that tells me these are one of those things you can't control. Like, like AT&T could have said in 1995, listen, we don't want anyone using the internet because we want people not making phone calls over digital. We want them to use, yeah. you know, the, the cell phone network we set up or the phone network we set up. And there's just no stopping it. Or, mm-hmm. or like when we put a cap on the price of gold, the market, the global market itself exceeded that cap. So, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, this was back in the seventies or whatever, early seventies. So I, I don't think the world can stop a steamroller once it, once it starts happening. I agree. And I agree to that sense of Bitcoin. Um, and the, the, the cool thing here where I will say I'm a Bitcoin maximalist, but I'm a realist. I want to make money. So if something goes up in a higher percent, I can still go back and buy more Bitcoin. Um, but I, I make that point because, because the value of Bitcoin does not mean that nothing else has value. And so there are many other digital assets that present very interesting solutions to many problems we have today. From shipping, like, oh my God, we might go through a food shortage. Well, do you know how much wasted food gets lost in, in transit? Boom, put it on blockchain, it's far better. Uh, healthcare data, um, like we've talked about NFTs or just tickets in general. Um, as well or, or, as many or, other and, and this is a, this is the value of ethereum so so uh, uh, as a bitcoin maximalist you might say okay well the lightning network could do anything ethereum can do but ethereum sort of is the winner in terms of making applications for on on top of smart contracts yeah yeah Wouldn't and I, I would yeah no i would say that ethereum is definitely the winner right now i would say that people that like are going to try to draw comparisons between bitcoin and ethereum They've already lost, even if they're like the Bitcoiner, right? Like that's where I I have a disconnect with a large percent of the Bitcoin maxi community um, because they try to draw comparisons when there is no comparing. The same way like Ethereum can't really compare itself to Bitcoin. So like the Lightning Network just was a big improvement to Bitcoin's transaction speed. Taproot, which just passed in November or got implemented, I should say, in November, but passed last May, uh, that gives... Bitcoin, a future possibility of actually creating smart contracts. So we'll see how that plays out. But Bitcoin is in its lane. Ethereum is in its own lane. It's like, I like this comparison a lot. Like if I told you uh, that Apple is a great company, it's worth money. They create this product called an iPhone. iPhones are pretty valuable for them. Well, 
you probably wouldn't say, well, no, there's Android. So why the hell would I want Apple? <laughs> no, you'd probably say right. like, oh, okay, both are tech, both are different companies. And then I told you Amazon is a company that ships things to people. Well, you wouldn't, a anyone in their right mind would not be like, well, no, I'm just going to own an iPhone versus go on amazon.com. What are you talking about? It doesn't even make sense. And so that's where cryptocurrency dilutes so much of the conversation because everyone thinks they're the same thing. Ripple, XRP solves the remittance problem we have between major banks that can help with your country's GDP. That does not necessarily mean that at all anything to do with Ethereum. And so there's so many different things that everything solves. Um, but yeah, uh, Ethereum, I, I definitely think Ethereum has immense value. Uh, and if, if I'm thinking about this the way I typically do, and when I consider that the dot-com bubble, what, 95 plus percent of companies fell completely off, never came back. I think the same thing will happen in this space. 95 plus will fall off. That 5% though, that sticks around, will be far better than Amazon ever turned out. This is great because like, not that, not only that I understand, like I get to see uh, from Jake's point of view how it could use, right? And everyone's say, saying that just a, a store of value, you know? Yeah. But this, this the uh, Jake has way more insight or way more better idea of how it could use as a currency um, rather than talking about how it used as a whole Bitcoin, like talk about how, you know, can use as a set or stuff like that, you know? Well, well. so my, my latest question is related to this, which is that obviously for the world to to start accepting or, or, or moving towards somewhat of a Bitcoin standard, eventually large institutions have to think, oh, it's better for me to hold Bitcoin than other things. Mm -hmm. And so does this recent volatility, like it's more than 50% down from its highs, does this recent volatility dissuade, you know, the S&P 500 companies or sovereign wealth funds from converting some small percentage of their assets to Bitcoin, which is what they were beginning to do before the last November? Yeah, I, no, I don't think so at all. Um, I think that the drawdown gives them a better opportunity, obviously in terms of a price sense, but the drawdown itself, I don't think really matters. Um, and I'll explain why that is. But if you look, if you zoom out on Bitcoin, I mean, it's still the best performing asset, whatever, can we say that yet? Like, <laughs> um, I mean, it's close enough, but, but still, if you look at any other asset or any other investment, it's the best performer year over year um, and most right. consistent. So the fact that it's down from 69,000 to 30,000, Sucks if you bought it 69000 but in its entire history, there was a point where no one had lost any money ever owning Bitcoin this year. That's a pretty wild thing. Um, but the fact that it is down, I don't think it dissuades them. I think that they probably know even better than I why price is going down. And from every calculation I can find and make, uh, it, it has to do with majority of leverage in the market. There's far too much leverage um, with with exchanges offering the user 100x leverage. So yes, I could put in a thousand and use the purchasing power of a hundred thousand dollars. So put in a million, <laughs> like what happens then? Um, and if you look at today, for example, if anyone wanted to check this, you can do it for free and go to uh, CoinGlass and see that there's been almost a billion dollars liquidated in the past 24 hours. And that's new to this cycle that's different than 2017 because there was no futures market then. And so that's why I think you still see so much volatility like this. Um, and you can literally see the patterns. I know you don't like TA too much, but you can literally see it taking place, uh, what's called cascading liquidations, where I can trigger, because I can see on exchange, because it's on, it's on chain, I can see how much leverage is on market, on a specific market, and where the majority of pain will be felt, aka where most people will be liquidated. So I can target that liquidation, boom, it hits, drops price further. Stop losses get hit, boom, drops price further. People see it, panic sell, drops price further. Quick rebound, I mean, that's when you see leverage come back onto the market long side. Guess what? All those people who are over leveraged now, I can quickly liquidate once more with all the profit I just made, bringing down the price two, 3%. Now it's down six. And then, and then, the, then everyone wakes up. Um, it's just the way the market works. I mean, that causes uh, yeah. the most pain to the most number of people possible all the time, no matter what the market is. It's just the way well, it works. So blockchain makes it easy because you can see where everybody's pain point is. And you get a guy like Michael Saylor saying, hey, we got 160,000 Bitcoin that we're going to liquidate at $21,000 if it gets there. All right, we'll take it there. <laughs> maybe maybe that's what the market wants to do. Right, to is, that, is that the danger? Like we, we, we know he's one of the biggest potential call them whales out there that could get liquidated. And he's already said the price he, can, he would have to get liquidated at. 
Uh, do you think the market takes it there? If anyone in the stock market said that, can you imagine what would happen? <laughs> it, it goes there right away, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're going to take you out. What do you think will happen? All right. So if Michael Saylor says that his liquidation point is around $20,000 and then they'll consider selling some, which they just put out in their most recent uh, earnings release. They have to sell. It's not consider. We have to sell it. <laughs> well, I think they'll probably just take on more debt. Uh, I don't know how. Oh, but good I, luck taking on debt when you're a uh, forced liquidation. Yeah, you're about to get liquidated. Yeah. yeah, see, that's the tough part. And that's where, um, <laughs> okay, so in the same way, the ups and downs in a couple months of the price of Bitcoin does not matter to a sovereign wealth fund. Right. Michael Saylor, in the grand scheme of what Bitcoin is and will become, does not matter either. Love him. Think he's one of the best CEOs. Uh, well, maybe not. I won't reach that far. But I think he's a great CEO. Um and, and a big advocate for Bitcoin. But at the same time, I think he became overzealot and I think that he overexposed and over leveraged. And that's why his liquidation price is now above the previous all time high, a clear place you should never have your liquidation price above. Um, and so if we do draw down, we're probably going to see $16,000 Bitcoin again, and he's going to be sh SOL. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, no, you should never do that because it paints a target on your back because now it's a game, right? And now, you can orchestrate enough capital and, and certainly enough liquidity to to move us there. Um, but in terms of our, our major institutions or sovereign wealth funds looking at Bitcoin le in less attractive uh, or in a less attractive manner, I don't think so at all. I agree. I think it is a part of every portfolio nowadays. Everyone, just like real estate, it now has to be a part of every uh, but, portfolio but, going forward. So. If you're not leveraged, you're going to have it in your portfolio for sure. Okay, so let's say the sovereign wealth fund of Saudi Arabia comes to you and say, listen, is now a time I should start be, uh, you know, I've got a couple of billion to spare. Should I start putting it into Bitcoin? Wouldn't you say, well, hey, let's wait and see if Michael Saylor is liquidated or, or would you say, yeah, go for it, but this is a risk? I think that they're already invested. I just don't think that we know it. Um, they're, I mean, look, they, yeah, the, everyone's in. China's in, um, UAE is in. Uh, Qatar is in. Qatar literally just partnered um, not too long ago with Ripple uh, for for creating a banking channel. So if they're considering Ripple, <laughs> I think that they probably already own Bitcoin. Um, and and I think that the the public announcements come once you've secured your position, as unfortunately any good investor would do. Um, I mean, look at uh, look at Goldman Sachs. Look at J.P. Morgan. I think that they <laughs> look at um uh, I'm forgetting the other uh, George Soros his family fund right I think that they're just the smaller versions of Qatar and the UAE making those announcements or sovereign wealth funds making those announcements full countries making those transitions um and if you like just for anyone that might not know the story there's certainly excellent videos on YouTube about it but J P Morgan sold anyone trading or anyone working on a trading desk if they traded Bitcoin they would fire he would fire them. Meanwhile, he was buying Bitcoin. Goldman Sachs said similar <laughs> things. Meanwhile, they were loading up on Bitcoin. George Soros said uh, something along the lines of dumbest investment ever, but his family fund quickly transitioned to allowing trading of Bitcoin. Um, and, and, and there's one further layer on top of that, which is that they also invested in all these crypto-focused venture capital funds. So, oh, yeah. so basically, in, on the one hand, invest in Bitcoin. On the other hand, let's invest in the ecosystem. Let's make sure mm -hmm. that there are thousands of companies, you know, starting to really use yeah. important real world use cases for, or starting to develop real world yeah. use cases for, for crypto. So I guess that's the final question, which is like, what's the, t like right now, I, I get like 2021 was great. I get it. Like billions of dollars a day was tra were traded on DeFi exchanges of, you know, but it was just crypto buying crypto and, and NFTs. It was, it was huge, but it was just digital collectibles. Mm -hmm. This I sort of feel like the next evolution has to be real world use cases where I can't yep. not not use crypto. And like, yep. what what do you think those use cases will be, and Absolutely. and what's the timeline for that? So I think within the next two years, you're going to be using crypto whether you like it or not. I think through a CBDC, literally, I think it's the top 100 companies in the world are all researching um, a, C a central bank digital currency. So the same way, like, oh, digital money someone's grandma might say, but not realizing that she gets money on Zelle or sends a Venmo and that's digital. Um, I think will be the same thing that happens to people. They won't realize that they're using a CBDC and it's a form of blockchain. And that's like the interlink that we think of now as to crypto. Um, 
but I think that is a huge push of it. I think that comes in the next two years. Um, I think the real world utility of NFT comes within the same time where from collectibles that we're going to start to see people actually develop, like I said, like the example of your, the title of your home on there. And we can already see it through applications like Proppy, uh, which gives people the ability to crowdfund the purchase and acquisition of real world, like real world property like real world land, like a McDonald's is literally on the front page of Proppy right now. Um, and so I think you'll have that. I think that Bitcoin will continue to be adopted as legal tender and smaller into gradually larger and larger countries. Um, I don't think inflation's going anywhere. So I think we probably within the next six to eight months hit a recession um, that probably lasts into 2023 quantitative tightening and quantitative tightening will get quickly taken back to easing and we'll have more liquidity in the markets. Um, so I know I just gave you a quick synopsis of where I think we're going in terms of, uh, in terms of markets, but in like the very cool and tangible uses of this technology, um, I think that we begin really, really getting deep in the waters within five years. Um, I'd be very surprised yep. past that. I kind of look back at the internet adoption, right? Like we didn't like, yeah, you were there, James. Uh, Jake was a year old, but we were there. <laughs> you just didn't know what was going to happen, but you knew it was the future. And it kind of had these booms and busts, all these crazy companies early on. But eventually, like, you know, around 2005 or so, it became mass adoption. Like, everybody was in the internet, right? Some of like, no matter what, you were still, you were now using it. Everyone had a website. It was the future. That's kind of where we are with crypto, I think. Like, you've seen this Wild West stuff for a while, but now... It is mass adoption time. Jake's right. I think everybody, old guys like me are going to be using it day to day pretty soon for countless things, not just currency, but the way we do transactions at sporting events, the way you trade companies stocks. and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Like right now there are these cryptos uh, that allow you to create synthetic stocks on these DeFi so they can be traded on these uh, DeFi exchanges. So, but I haven't yet seen them used really. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think these, uh, you know, Synthetics, like like synthetics yeah. or or UM, UMA, you think they'll be start to be used at some point? Not necessarily UMA so much, but I think uh, synthesized and tokenized securities, absolutely. So if you look at Binance, they're already offering it, but most people in the U.S. can't use it. Um, so they have they have tradable Amazon, Tesla, Spotify, I believe Apple shares right now, um, and so those are already on there. And so that's why I give it such a short time horizon, um, because I think that similar to the dot com. Um, I don't want to say bubble because it sounds like like this is going to blow up tomorrow. Um, but similar to that that kind of experience, I think that this comes twice as fast and has twice the impact. Um, and I think that, yeah, we can get into like the tokenization of everything and then we'll get lost in the weeds and how that is still blockchain and that is still crypto. Um, and I think all that comes. But the, the, the truth that I think everyone needs to really hear is that there will only be 5% maybe that lasts, maybe even less than that. Um, and, and understanding the history of this space is crucial to understanding, understanding the future. Um, because otherwise, it's like I, I feel so bad for people that got in just 2020 or 2021 or I guess now 2022 um, because their perception of what this space is is so jaded with like buy the dip and up only and NFTs like <laughs> – that they're they're missing out on a very cool piece of the history that is going to create the future. Um, yeah. Well, look, and Jake and Jeff, so much information downloaded here. You, you got to come back on again every time. There's another like this is a big moment for crypto. I feel like it's the it's the biggest drawdown since 2018, and yet the use cases every single day are are. I mean, there's. Unlike 2018, there's actual real users of crypto right now, and 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 billions of dollars being being spent every single day. So this is an interesting moment, and and it'll be interesting to see what happens. And it's great and refreshing to get your very knowledgeable take on it. Where could people read your stuff? Both both you guys, because so you both work together. You trade the markets. You trade cryptos. You obviously know a huge amount. Uh, I want you guys to come back on again and and report on what you see. But like, where can people read your stuff in the meantime? Well, I'm like the nerdy economist side of it. Jake's actually the crypto guy, obviously. Jake knows his stuff when it comes to crypto. <laughs> uh, if you want to learn more about Jake on crypto, we'll just set up a domain. Actually, uh, you can get Jake's product for free. If you're listening to your stuff right now, James, we'll just give it to you for free. So you can go to Raging Bull, 
uh, forward slash or slash James. Okay. And we'll set a domain up. You can get uh, you can get Jake stuff for free right now. We'll give it to you, just so you can check it out. He's got a great product right now called Coin Drop, where you can get information on airdrops and all those day to day stuff. And he's got he's got new products coming all the time, but you can have that one absolutely free, no problem. So so ragingbull.com slash James. Yeah, James. Excellent. We'll set that up. And you guys have to come on again, and because I'm going to have a thousand more questions. We should do like an NFT time. I think that really is that both yeah. of you guys have this connection on NFTs. Jake's got endless ideas there. I know you do too. So I'd love to hear what you guys both have to say about NFT side. So I, I think I think NFTs are going to create so many billionaires just on, on the entrepreneurial side, not on the investing side, on the entrepreneurial side. There are so many opportunities for, for NFTs. It like is amazing to me that this opportunity is here, right? It's insane. It seems yeah. it seems absurd that there's so much liquidity and capital available for it. Yeah. And, and the thing is the venture capitalists are getting funded. So, so uh, we'll see what happens next, but anyway, you guys, thanks so much. We had a lot of technical difficulties putting together this podcast, but <laughs> you were troopers and I learned a huge amount, which it. I can't always say about every podcast. And thanks again. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you guys. That was great, man. Thanks for having us on. We appreciate it. Thanks. Bye guys. Thank you.